think all of you lawyers know how important administrative and regulatory law is, uh, particularly in this day and age. So now, I, I'm almost sad that now I'm introducing the last session of this convention because it's been so terrific. Um, but I am delighted to be able to introduce the moderator for this, uh, this panel. Uh, this, the closing plenary is uncovering the court. And we have gotten some of the best people in that business. Here to introduce them and lead the discussion is Tom Goldstein. Give him a round of applause. You all know him. What? He's, he's left the room. So I'll talk about him. I'll tell you a little bit more about him. Um, he is, as all of you know, the publisher and a regular contributor to SCOTUS blog. Uh, and, uh, and recently hired away from ACS, one of our, uh, our fellows. Um, so he obviously has good choice, uh, good, good taste in, uh, in, his, uh, in who he employs as well. But SCOTUS blog is obviously a place that we all go uh, uh, in addition to uh, the uh, reporters you're going to hear from shortly. But it's uh, obviously a critical source for us on uh, decision days and else and other times uh, of what's going on uh, in the court. Tom has argued 28 cases before the Supreme Court. He's also been named one of the 50 most influential people in Washington, one of the 40 most influential lawyers of the past decade. And he's returned, I'm glad, I don't have filibustering. Um, and the 100 most influential lawyers in the nation. I think it's, this goes on, actually. I have a lot that I can be saying here. One of the 90 greatest Washington, D.C. lawyers of the past 30 years. One of the 30 best lawyers in Washington. And he's just one of the best. So um, I am really pleased to have Tom up here. Um, and, uh, so and I will now turn it over to you. Thank you so much. <coughs> can you all hear me now? Oh. Thanks so much. It is great to have the best seat in the house for a panel about the Supreme Court and the press. Uh, and we have four people who are incredibly experienced and talented in this. And as they join me, uh, Kim Atkins, who is with Lawyers USA, a legal publication. Joan Biskupic, who is legal editor and reporter for Reuters. Nina Totenberg from NPR. <laughs> and Adam Liptak with the New York Times. <laughs> so the four of us in talking about this program thought that there would be two things that we could do that would be most helpful and most interesting to you. And they would be to give you a sense of what it's like to be a member of the Supreme Court Press Corps, the challenges that the press face as they relate to the court, particularly as the court changes, as technology changes, as the media change. And then to talk about the role of the media in respect of four particular cases uh, that, or groups of cases, that are in front of the court this year that you've been thinking about already. So same-sex marriage, affirmative action, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, and cases related to DNA, both Myriad and King, the arrestee DNA case. And it. through those decisions and through these folks talking with you about what it is that they do each morning, we hope to give you a sense of how it is that the court relates to the press and the reverse and what it is that these folks are doing as they think each day about getting you information about what the court has decided and about the arguments and the like and the broader trends and the jurisprudence and all of those sorts of things. So why don't we start it off by dividing things up according to the way in which each of these reporters works because each of them operates in multiple media so nobody now can ignore the web but each of them has particular experience. So we talk about, we can talk with Nina about what it's like to broadcast, Adam to print in the paper and also on the web, Kim in terms of a legal publication and new technologies, and Joan 
when she works for Reuters, which has a particular audience and is a wire service, and also Joan has done very famous and incredibly well-received biographies. So Nina, if we think first, <clears throat> let's maybe use a couple of cases because they might illustrate changes in the court and changes in how the press operates. 10 years ago, in the last week of the term, the court was deciding both Lawrence versus Texas and Grutter against the University of Michigan Law School. And I wonder, then and now, when you get huge decisions like, say, the decisions in same-sex marriage, what is it that you are trying to do, both in terms of physically managing the process and report, and what is it you are trying to do in, in conveying information to the country? Well, these are, you plan for, you have to plan assiduously for these things. My one-time one intern, Tom Goldstein, initiated <laughs> a plan that I have for dealing with all things considered in Morning Edition, which is I pre-book everybody for every important case. That means that they get disappointed more often than not because it doesn't happen when... I've, I've already booked for two weeks. I mean, <laughs> nothing much has happened in any of those cases except... The gene patent case, which is a good example of the foibles of this. So I had a great roster of gene patent experts to talk to. And the, most, the one who spoke the, the most English about this subject was a Nobel laureate by the name of Richard Roberts, who was the, the scientific director at Biolabs in Boston, and actually could make, was able to tell me what cDNA was so that I could understand it. Which, and he was, I had tried. I had talked to at least 15 people who had told me what it was, but I couldn't understand it. And so I had him booked for every day until the end of the term, except one, <laughs> because he was going to be on a plane to Hong Kong, and that was the day that the case came down. And Mary King, who actually uh, discovered BRCA1, was on jury duty. <laughs> And thank God she got sprung, but it was, she did get sprung, and, but she was three hours uh, earlier than we were, so that made it a little hairy. I still had, I think, seven or eight people lined up. Being that they were all patent experts, only about four of them made it onto the air because the other three didn't speak English, um, <laughs> despite my best efforts. So, I line up people for every day in every, what I deem to be every major case, and it's a, it's a spreadsheet with their telephone numbers. They're each allocated a time slot. Are you, will you be free at 1 o'clock Eastern time? Yes, okay. I'll be calling you at exactly 1 o'clock, and at 1.15 that, that interview will be over because there's somebody else scheduled at 1.15. It works really well. In the case of the ACA, I did 11 interviews in an hour and a half, I think. And so I had plenty for morning edition, plenty for all things considered, but I have other venues I have to worry about. And oh, of course, those interviews have to be cut. You have to pick what you want out of them. They do usually give me a producer, which they don't normally, at the very end of the term. So somebody's sitting with me during those interviews and I say, let's pull where he said this and pull where he said that. I may use one for morning and one for ATC. But the very first time I'm going to be on the air is likely to be at 11 o'clock um, live in the morning edition, which is 8 o'clock on the West Coast. And for big cases, they completely shake up the show. And I'm there live talking about what the court did. And it's the principal reason, other than my own oddness, that um, I sit in the courtroom to hear the announcement of opinions because it's the best way that I know of to understand what the court has done and to not miss some major caveat. I could easily miss it reading, um, reading even the summary. At the, but you, I think you, you would not miss it in the courtroom. It does sometimes, once or twice, I've had to get up and leave. Um, I think during the during the, one of the Guantanamo cases, the dissents went on so long, I had to get up and leave to go downstairs to file live to, and at, at 11 o'clock. Um, 
And then, of course, there is the web. Now, NPR usually assigns, on a very big case, assigns somebody else to write the first web piece. As soon as I'm done with All Things Considered, I will turn around and convert my story into a web piece. And then I'll do morning edition. And in between, I'll do newscast spots. So it's a busy day. So Adam, <laughs> I'm struck by a few things. One is the centrality of the interviews and how it is the person speaks to what Nina does. And I'm really interested in whether that holds true for you in any respect. Also, both of you stayed upstairs during the ACA. It was a really important part of your process. You, you had a focus on understanding it yeah, all. Other folks up, had a different focus. <laughs> um, the, and so I wonder and what pressures you feel given the move towards the web versus getting something in the paper the next day. Uh, so on that last question first, I've given a lot of thought to new media, and I could give you a descriptive answer, a normative answer, but I think the best way to think about it is, is it good for lip tech? And, and the, <laughs> the answer to that is surely no. <laughs> the proper way to do newspaper journalism, as the great Linda Greenhouse, who's with us, used to do it, is to go to the announcement of the uh, decision by the justices of the Supreme Court, who will sit there and patiently explain to you what they think of the highlights, to come downstairs, to read the whole decision, to digest, consider, mull, have a sandwich, and at the end of the day, in the fullness of time, give birth to a beautifully constructed newspaper story that considers context and consequences. That was the old way to do it. The way I do it now, in the Gene Patton case is an example of this, I do go upstairs, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. When I come downstairs, we posted a 75-word version of what just happened in 15 minutes, and then a 400-word version, maybe half an hour later, a 600-word version in the afternoon, and a pretty good 1,200-word version for the paper. Each of those versions was read by fewer people than the first, than the, the one before it, meaning there's an inverse relationship between quality and readership. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's, the, the whole thing is troubling, and yet I don't know how to address it because the need, or a news organization, need to tell people right away what's happening given the competition, given how good SCOTUS blog is, given that the wire services have always been good, given that, and this is a fairly recent development, the underlying resource materials are now widely available to whoever wants. So you're working in a different kind of environment. I do take a little comfort from something I saw on Slate this morning, where an actual scientist reviewed Justice Thomas's uh, gene patent decision and said that his account of the science had uh, the quality of an earnest seventh grader's book report. <laughs> And I thought, well, if I can aspire to that, I will be doing Supreme Court quality work. <laughs> um, as far as going upstairs or not, we're ne we now have a real split in the press corps, and the geography of the court matters a little bit. There's a press room downstairs where we have little cubicles, and as soon as, as soon, little, Very as soon as the justices start announcing the decision, the paper copy is handed out to those people who are downstairs and they can start writing and filing. Alternatively, you can go upstairs and listen to this, I completely agree with Nina, very valuable explanation, but you're incommunicado, have no electronics, and it takes 20 or 30 minutes often. And that means you are inaccessible to your very, very nervous editors. Um, and so we have repeatedly had the conversation, both in healthcare and now for the upcoming big decisions we're about to have, about do we still do this? And I half volunteered to say, screw it, if you want me to write fast, I'll write fast. And bless him, my bureau chief, David Leonhardt, says, no, there's historical context here to ha not have the time Supreme Court correspondent in the room to see these things being handed down would be terrible. But, and uh, Joan still goes upstairs. Kimberly, I don't know what you do. Nina comes upstairs. I'm, well, if I'm there for oral arguments, I'm, I'm there for it. But my, I don't get a little cub cubicle in the Supreme Court building. My, my office is downtown. So on mere decision days, I'm watching but, SCOTUS but, blog like everyone else. But the LA Times has given up going upstairs. Uh, the Wall Street Journal no longer goes upstairs. So that's a, that's a, that's a, a real live illustration of the schism between the, the, the pressure that you media well, puts and on you. The, but the one great thing is that SCOTUS blog is there. And in the, ACA, in the case of the ACA, which I think made true believers of the world about the value of SCOTUS blog, but already at NPR, we had a system set up where essentially it was like an election. 
we had a, two editors who had to agree on calling the, ga the, calling the game or, the, or the, the election, who won, who lost, and, and, and they were hooked up to SCOTUS Block at the same time. And so while I was still upstairs, they were writing things based on the wires, because we still take the wires, apparently unlike a lot of TV <coughs> networks, the wires and SCOTUS blog and two editors. And we still had something on the web in, I think, by 1010. And I, there's one question I didn't answer, so let me answer it quickly. I do a lot less quoting of people, I think, than Nina does. I think there's enough material in the briefs, in the opinion, if you know, what readers pay us for is to write that on our own authority. Well, it's a different medium, no, right? It's but you're absolutely right. There's plenty in there, but it's not, you ha may have n noticed that it is not an audio You need same-day audio. I need same-day audio. I need different voices. I may have a six or seven minute piece, which is an eternity on the radio. I can't talk the whole time. And you sure? I'm positive. <laughs> it's not entertaining. Well, it might be entertaining, but it, not, not if I were to just read excerpts of the opinion. And what you find when you write for radio in a narrative is that you really do have to truncate what the justices said. And it's one of the reasons that I really like, often like, if it's very exciting, I like the All Things Considered piece better because I'm able to convey that drama. But if, it's, if, it, if I need real time to think about it, and to digest it, the morning piece is better. So let me turn. I want to talk about the wires, Joan, with you, and then legal newspapers, and then come back to biographies, if we sure. do, which is really the long-form, multi-year effort. So you have worked for The Post, for the USA Today, and now for Reuters, which has you know, an incredibly wide readership and also a focused one to some extent. It, it is a wire, a wire, it's a wire service that has general readership and also a business readership. So what is it that you're doing, you're thinking about as the decisions come down? I'm fortunate enough that I have a partner who actually does the daily immediate thing that has to get out on the wire, Lawrence Hurley. But my job is, so my job is to have something that it has a value added, but it's also fast, but much more analytical. So that's why I have the luxury, as Adam said, of being up in the courtroom listening to what the justices say and thinking about what won't be said immediately and maybe won't even be said the next day except for by me. So I do pre-writing like my colleagues do, but I do pre-writing in the sense that I'm putting together maybe some um, element of the case that hasn't gotten a lot of attention yet, trying to be prepared in a different way one, uh, than what I would say if I wanted to tell people immediately what had happened in the ruling. One example just in the last 10 days was the Maryland versus King DNA case. I was up in the courtroom. I wasn't going to write exactly what they ruled because my partner had that. Instead, I focused on Justice Scalia's dissent, uh, where that came from, what that was all about, a little bit of context about um, who, he was able, who, who was on it with him, who wasn't. Again, to give, to give readers something a little different. Now, I actually would like to take a little bit more time, but for me now, taking just two or three hours is a huge luxury, and that, so that's what I get to do. Sometimes I'll feed what we call the trunk. In, um, Reuters, of course, has you know, 3,000 people across the globe, and so many of our readers are interested in, you know, again, the, the financial element. Every one of our stories will have you know, how stock was doing you know, in response to it. And uh, because of the uh, Thompson element that is part of Reuters now, which owns Westlaw and has a very big you know, uh, legal accounting tax readership within it, we'll always have something that we think maybe you know, a professional readership would want, as well as the general readership for the um, wire stories that would be picked up across the country. So kind of serving several audiences, but my specific need is to serve people in a way that nobody else would be writing the story with that kind of puts an extra burden on me. It's an interesting example of, while we talk about retraction in the media, Thomson Reuters added you to this team. You already mm -hmm. had an uh, you know, experienced reporter at the court in the press room, and then they brought you in to add another perspective. And I, I wonder what everybody thinks about the trajectory of investment in the Supreme Court um, from media organizations. Is it you know, static? Is it expanding? Is it retracting? And what are the consequences for the public understanding? Joan does more than the Supreme Court. She's the legal editor. She does everything. So she oversees not just the court, but the, the whole shebang. It's an odd thing, I think, that at the same time that 
a lot of major media organizations actually have devoted less time to the Supreme Court. So the networks, um, NBC probably is the most devoted because Pete is a, is a you know, is, is, he's a one-man band with like 10 different arms. I don't know how he does everything he does and so well. But uh, by and large, you can notice that there really is a relatively small core of people who are there all the time for anything of any significance that's going to happen. At the same time, there's all this academic explosion of, in the blogosphere, which didn't exist before, not to mention uh, aggregating in addition to that. So, used to, I mean, just if I read everything I should, I'd never do anything. <laughs> so, I don't read everything I should. I think the Supreme Court continues to be very well covered. And the problem with legal journalism really is that we focus too obsessively on the court and not enough on the work of courts around the country, state Supreme Courts and circuit courts, which often issue decisions that have far vaster impact on people's lives than some second-rate Supreme Court decision that will affect <laughs> four armed criminals, you know. Um, we, 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 will, we will write just about any Supreme Court decision, particularly on a slow day, and we will overlook a Ninth Circuit decision that has much, much bigger impact. So, Kim, you have you know, two special roles. One is you write for a legal publication in Lawyers USA, and also you may be the one who's most active in focusing on web publication and also things like Twitter. And so I wonder how kind of you kind of grew up like I did with a very experienced press score out there. How have you been finding your space in it? What is it that your publication look, is looking for? Well, yeah, so it, in the sort of uh, the, the trajectory of all of this, my focus is often very, at the very beginning, like literally while I'm walking out of the courtroom toward my office, to the metro, I'm like this because I'm tweeting um, if it's a major case, some of the things that have happened, and then uh, leaving the, you know, the, writing a short news piece, but then afterwards I write a more analytical piece that is written largely for lawyers and business people um, who know this stuff, so I feel like the pressure is on a little bit more. I can't, you know, when I used to work for the Globe or the Herald, I can sort of flub a little bit of it if I didn't fully understand it, but when you're writing for lawyers, you really can't, so you have to know what you're talking about. I appreciated Justice Thomas's uh, Myriad decision, by the way, because I thought it was great, I understood it, you know, so I, th I thought that it was fabulous. But, um, but you know, the, the initial part of that is interesting because with new media, it's an increased focus on covering in a new media type of way one of the most old media institutions that there are. I mean, all that we're allowed in the courtroom is this, some paper and a pen. Can't take a cell phone, can't take anything. And readers want to know exactly what's happening right away. And, and it's great that SCOTUS blog has found a, you know, a great way to do that for the release of opinions, to have that in real time on a live blog. But you, know, you can't tweet what's going on during the uh, health care arguments or during the same-sex marriage arguments. And so I find myself doing things, like I have my notebook and I divide it up to you know, write down the broader points that I'm going to analyze later. And I literally have a section where I write little notes that are under 140 characters because <laughs> I'm, pre I'm preparing what I am going to tweet the minute I leave the courtroom because people really want to know what happened, you know, what's going to happen. I also find that there's a lot more interest. I mean, uh, Adam was talking about how the earlier stories get the most readership. And I find that there is a tremendous uh, more interest in what happens at oral argument than there is uh, when the actual decisions come down. <laughs> people are, people, and, and what they want, what a lot of my readers and followers want to know, which it took me a long time to get comfortable with. Uh, they want me to make predictions. They want to know how the court's going to rule, even more than how the court actually does rule when they do rule. <laughs> and so in that sense, it's just like, well, what happens or what does this mean? I remember after uh, the Prop 8 case, I'm tweeting about the possibility, it seemed at oral arguments, that the case could be dismissed as improvidently granted. And I'm trying to explain on Twitter <laughs> what that means, and people are asking me questions, you know, send me back responses, and what does that mean, and what's the fallout, and so some of my lawyer friends sort of joined the conversation and helped to explain it, which I was very uh, <laughs> thankful for, but it's just these different kinds of, you know, competing interests, and, and to say that it, it is important to say that the Supreme Court has advanced a lot in terms of 
the information that they release, you know, transcripts are available same day, uh, occasion, occasionally, seems more rarely this term, uh, uh, audio transcripts are available on the same day. Audio and tape. Audio ta yeah, audio tape. Audio recordings are available the same day. And, you know, they give us more information to us and to everyone, but it's just really interesting trying to balance this new media with this institution that still wants us to use pencil and paper. Can I pause on this question of Twitter? And just whether you all see some value in it or are on Twitter because an editor has told you that we're doing Twitter now. And I just, I am interested in, because it is, you know, these cases are complicated. Uh, they're technical. You know what people pick up from me in Twitter, and I don't tweet a lot, but I do, you know, you're supposed to do it, so I try to do it. Um, <clears throat> but in truth, what they pick up, what, what you can tell, how many people have, and how many they tell you how many are your, it's a favorite or whatever the hell that means. Um, uh, I bear, listen, I, I only learned how to text about three years ago. So, so uh, but what gets picked up are the things that are not the news by and large. They are, uh, I did a piece about, um, about Sotomayor presiding over over the reenactment of uh, the Kurt Flood case. And I, um, I tweeted something like, um, Sotomayor in chief seat for reenactment of Flood v. Kuhn. And I think that had more pickups than anything of any significance that I've done probably in six months. <laughs> and? So uh, and I want your answer on this too, because I know you're a Twitter presence. I think it's, it's fun. It allows readers in our paywall system to get behind the paywall, because if you come through a Twitter link, um, <laughs> you don't have to, you know, it doesn't count against whatever the limit is. And it establishes a sort of community and relationship between uh, you and your readers. Uh, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. It's way down on the list of things we ought to be doing. It is a vehicle through which to take note of something goofy that might not rise to the level of a story. Yeah. You all? Joan? Yeah, I tweet uh, more minimally than Adam and probably, and you too, Kimberly, but probably equal to about Nina. You know, I'll, I'll do links to stories and occasionally just throw something out there. But I find, you know, again, it's interesting. Uh, covering this beat, you tend to have a, a certain level of caution that stops you from, some of us, from just whipping something out there. And to actually even just do that few number of ca characters, I feel does require some thought. Like, I'm afraid I'm going to screw something up, so I'm like, eh, might as well move on to something else. I'll read an amicus brief rather than tweet. So I don't, I, it just doesn't come as naturally, although I'm working on it. Yeah. Well, the other thing you really worry about is there are people who read every word I say every week and that I say on television. And I know this because things happen that are not necessarily pleasant because they didn't see that I was smiling so they didn't on TV so they didn't know it was a joke um, who are looking to embarrass me I don't want to give them any ammunition <laughs> thank you <laughs> so I'm very cautious about what I do just boom like that I try to but, be but here's an example you all had the Justice Stevens yesterday tell you that the vote in Maryland v. King is now actually six to four and that's, that's the kind of thing that I'm not going to, it doesn't rise to the level of a story, but it certainly rises to the level of something fun. And you, the court immediately put out the, the prepared uh, text of his remarks, and you send that to your readers, and that's some value added. Sure. And readers love that. I mean, I find that readers love the, the anecdotal stuff or, or the things that would never turn up in the story. I mean, most of what goes in what I tweet about or what I blog about on the website um, are those things that happen, you know, whether it's during oral arguments or something that someone says, or if some, it's also a good tool if I don't have time to write about, you know, a great piece that I see Adam has written about, it's, it's a great way to tweet it out, and, you know, I'm still covering it, I'm, my readers still know I'm aware that these things are happening, um, but you can share that information, but people love to hear different things, you know, how. Do you find that you think in 140 characters? I'm not at that level yet. I'm not at that <laughs> level yet, so. But we can all aspire it takes, to it. <laughs> <laughs> I bet she though. does and she doesn't know it. <laughs> How many times do you have to trim back and something you've just banged out? In a, in a tweet? Mm-hmm. 
Um, not very often. But, 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 but Kimberly, you, you do, I think you make an important point. The culture of Twitter, and to an extent the culture of news, has really changed from not taking account of what the competition is doing to, to, to pointing to the competition when you think they're doing something good. And I think that's quite healthy. Yeah, yeah that is a great sharing mechanism for us. We don't really use it as an adjunct to what it is that we're doing on the blog, but rather as an attempt to kind of call out what other people are doing or something that we're doing on the blog. I've gone in waves about my thinking about how important Twitter is. There was a time when I thought, gosh, we can get to you know, now 93,000 people in less than a second. And it will take a while for the, that number of people to get to the blog, so maybe Twitter is an incredibly important thing to do. But I think that the depth of attachment to the, of, of the Twitter followers is much lower than the readers on the blog or the listeners at NPR or the readers of the New York Times and what it is that you all are writing. And so it's much easier for us to put something on Twitter and have it be missed. So we will use it for breaking news. We do have a, you know, a, a lot of people who will watch it for what happens immediately on the decisions. A lot of those people are, are on uh, the live blog. But the other thing it does is it allows for an exponential distribution effect. And that is that we can write something and it'll go to 93,000. And within a minute, it will be at 400,000. And then at a million or two million within a, a, a couple of minutes after that. And that's something that we just we can't do in any other way. So I, I think it's, it's useful in, in those respects. Um, maybe we'll turn the corner and start talking about some particular cases, both with respect to you know, what's happened, what we think the court might do, but also in this you know, space of what, how, what it's like to cover these cases. Uh, and so the ones that we were going to talk about, as I mentioned, were same-sex marriage and affirmative action, uh, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, and also the DNA cases. Um, oh, but uh, before we do that, I apologize. I really did want to talk about biographies, if we could, for a second, which is, I think, a whole other important way of covering the court. It's very focused on an individual rather than an institution, but you've done two incredible biographies of Justices O'Connor and Justice Scalia, and so I wonder about your thoughts about that whole process, which has to be fascinating and different. Yeah, well, I think in terms of 300 pages, <laughs> it's rather than 140 yeah. characters, but it's, it's actually been great to have another way to um, look at the court and to use material I get on a daily and weekly basis. Um, I'm in the middle of the very long middle of one on the p a political history of how we ended up with our first Hispanic justice. So, you know, it's, it's not straight biography, but at least I'm benefiting from uh, seeing Justice Sotomayor up there and thinking about Miguel Estrada, thinking about Jose Cabranes, thinking about a lot of things. What's, that the, what's the schedule? When can we buy it? <laughs> as soon as I write it. Okay. Yeah. No. Um, hopefully I'll be done with it at the end of this year. It's, uh, it's taking a little bit longer than the other ones because my day job's a little bit more demanding these, uh, now, but, but hopefully next year. Right. In fact, I'd love to come out for the... Um, the confirmation hearings that we all are thinking we probably would have a, a year from now at this time, or maybe a little later. So, because I think it would be timely about the process and then how things um, things operate at the court. But what it allows me to do is take what I see during oral arguments, or take what I can get in interviews with justices. Actually, writing books is a good way to get in to see the justices more because they're they're. Um, much more inclined to meet with you if they think you've got something longer in the works. And I find it very reinforcing with the job. When I was still with USA Today and working on something uh, related to Scalia, I went to see Justice Ginsburg, who of course is a you know, close friend of Justice Scalia, and she was talking about him in many ways uh, for the book project. But then as an aside, I said, you know, we just had that Arizona strip search case. You know, you seem very distressed on the bench about it. And that's when she said to me the line about they've never been a 13-year-old girl which ended up being a terrific story then for the newspaper. And you know she was cool with my doing that. So it's, it's a way to take what, frankly, all of my colleagues know. I don't feel like, I, I feel like I only have an outlet for what all of us know. The other thing is, you've probably noticed, all of us have been around for a while. We're all completely into it. We all think we're appointed for life. And having yet another um, medium for this is just, has just been worthwhile, although it's causing a lot of sleep deprivation. <laughs> All right, so uh, as we transition to cases, don't forget that you have note cards uh, and that you can uh, write questions and they'll be collected and brought up and we'll spend the last half hour or so uh, answering, these folks will spend the last half hour answering your questions. So, Nina, let's start with same-sex marriage. Um, the court is uh, confronting, obviously, two cases. This I'd like to say this whole thing is rigged. <laughs> Adam, we divided up what we were going to say a few minutes about, and Adam took D 
DNA no, no, and no. gene. Kim has. Kim, Kim has. has. Kim has <laughs> DNA and gene, gene, gene patterning. And gene patterning. Well, that means that she's the only person who actually has outcomes. <laughs> <laughs> she's the only person. So, what do you want to know about St. <laughs> uh, uh, obviously, not what happened. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the. It's an illustration, I suppose, of the evolution of the court in some respects. The court last came to these sorts of issues maybe with Lawrence in 2003, and we'll have a similar experience when we start talking about affirmative action. Um, what do you think of the dilemmas of covering the cases? What's the level of interest comparing these cases, for example, with ACA last term and other major cases? And, you know, you've been covering the court for a little while. What, where do these cases maybe rank in their historical importance? There are, a, you know, a lot of people here who are relatively new to being law students and law school graduates. There isn't, it's not easy to have a perspective on whether this is truly a massive historical moment or just kind of another day at the office. Well, I thought the ACA case is a good example of how you're not sure, and we're not sure even now, whether this is, uh, this is the beginning of a new, um, a whole new approach to curtailing the powers of Congress in the area of the Commerce Clause and perhaps other areas. And we're not going to know that for some time. It was a huge, I'd say, week-long story. Um, made, made a little longer. Made, it made it to a week because of the story that, that Roberts had, quote, changed his mind. Um, and if had it not been for that, I'm not sure it would have been more than a two or three day story because the outcome is what mattered in the instant case. I think that the same sex marriage cases, uh, since I am inclined to think that we won't get a real answer on Prop 8, we could, but we're li more likely not to get a complete answer, that that will set the stage for more and more legal questions involving same-sex marriage. And so it'll be, I think it will be historic in the way that Lawrence was historic. Uh, but unless the court decides either that there is a constitutional right to marry, which I consider to be pretty long shot odds, or the other way, that it's really up to the states, um, we're going to be a bit in limbo. So our job, I think, is going to be to say, well, what does this mean in California? And what does this mean for other states, if anything? Well, I am really interested in that question. That morning, you all are going to get two decisions. What is it, and you're going to face the kind of crush that we've talked about already, to get information out there. Given the multiple layers of the two cases, the different issues that they present, what is it that you are going, are you going to do this all together as a package? What is it that you're going to try and get out in the, the short and medium term? What is it, what, yeah. what are you, For me, it'll what's be, your dilemma? It'll be a package. It'll be the t the two together. Mm -hmm. And then there'll be other stories. I mean, I will highlight things that I expect our correspondents in California to pick up, for example. Uh, but I will be the umbrella story for, the two, for those two. And, and the same, I think, you could say about the other big cases, the race cases. Those will be, um, whether they come separately or together, they, I will do the umbrella story, and then other people will pick up tentacles of that story. Well, two things come to mind about that that I'd love to follow up about. One is the notion of the story that said the chief changed his vote in ACA. And not whether it's right or wrong. I, you know, it's, it's a leak, and it's very hard to know for sure without inside information what happened. But it, it does strike me that other press corps focus very hard on stories like that, and that the competition in the beat, you talked about competitors, Adam, the competition in the beat is to break things like that. And I wonder how you see the Supreme Court press corps functioning and where the role of, what the role of stories like that is in what it is that you do. We're journalists like anybody else, uh, and just as a journalist covering the State Department or the Pentagon wants to find out the secret stuff, we do too. But it's very hard because this is the rare institution in Washington 
that with the notable exception of health care and the broad outlines of that, but maybe not the particulars do seem right to me, uh, it really doesn't leak. Uh, but I don't think that we have any cultural predisposition uh, against finding out secret stuff. I think that's our job. Do you pursue it, like in your daily work? I uh, can't get into sources and methods. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's what made it the story, though, to me. It wasn't just that you had this leak and, and Robert just changed his mind. Is that I had been writing a lot leading up to that about how there are no leaks at the Supreme Court, and then here's this massive <laughs> leak. I mean, that's what made it interesting. Yeah. I mean, I'll dissent. I think that culturally, as an observer and a mild participant, I do think it's different culturally. And I think that that may be driven by the institution, how hard it is ever to get something or get something in a way that you could use it. Well, it's also the case uh, that I think has been, has been mentioned. People on this beat stay for a long, long time. And that is unusual in journalism. In journalism, you typically get put on a new beat every few years, in part because you tend to take on the values of the institution you cover, and you tend to start to be protective of the people you like at that institution. So it's, diplomats call this clientism. So for that reason, in most journalism, people get moved off a beat after a while and put someone fresh in there. Here, the value of the expertise you develop over time far outweighs whatever that value would be. But it's possible, Tom, that because of living in that environment, it maybe warps what ought to be your journalistic well, instinct. Well, as as speaking as a person who's broken a few of those stories that you weren't supposed to get over the years, I think that if you're constantly sort of on the make for them, you do harm yourself as a reporter at this institution. If you observe something that leads you to be able to break a story like that, which I think was the case in every one of the ones, and there are very few that I've ever broken, uh, there is a reason that you noticed it. You know, if you, if you notice, it, the, one of the big stories I broke too long ago to remember, it was that the Supreme Court, um, that there were not four, there were, there were, the Supreme Court had, not, had voted not to take the Watergate appeals, but that Chief Justice Berger was holding up disposition of the case, looking for a fourth vote. Now, at some point, I started poking around, because this doesn't seem very complicated. You either take the appeals or you don't. I mean, it's not like, and I just sort of, I poked, and I got back an avalanche. And the reason I got back an avalanche is that there was such dismay at what was going on. If you, a lot of times you poke and nothing happens. Or you can't find the corroboration that you need. So it, it's not worth your time in a beat like this, which is much more explanatory than it is scoop-oriented. I love a good scoop, but you can't operate on this beat as a the way you do at the White House. It's not the same. Now Joan made the good point that the justices are more apt to talk to book authors. So that a Tubin or Marsha Coyle has some, some nice detail mm -hmm. in her new book is more likely to break. And a couple years later, uh, interesting things about what happened behind the scenes in, say, uh, Citizens United. That also, the Nina's point might explain a little bit about the experience with the chief's vote at the end of last term because Frustration can, it seems, lead to leaks. Somebody wants revenge or is very angry about something, and the court as a whole seems to get along so well. And the law clerks who might want to gossip are so afraid of saying anything and ending their careers that there just may not be the natural opportunities where there's infighting in the White House or the State Department right. or things like that. Mm -hmm. I will say that we face a, one other layer of the dilemma that I'll mention briefly, and that's our practice in front of the court. So that every once in a while, we'll know something that happens at the court um, that is not public, is not important, but uh, the court last week granted a case of ours involving arbitration and accidentally disclosed on the website that it had granted it th three or four days earlier. Um, and it was a weird situation for me as the lawyer in the case. There's $180 million at stake. Um, and I couldn't tell our client. It was client. The, the Supreme Court how did, yes. how did that happen? How did they, how did they it was a glitch. Um, oh my God. <laughs> how, how can we make it happen a, more? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's, it's a glitch. Yeah, it's happened uh, about 10 times over the course of 15 years where they t enter coding in wow. uh, incorrectly. And so we've had it, we've had wow. it in a whole series of cases where I'll just go to the court and tell them. <laughs> 
do you really want to say cert granted uh, when but, you're not? Wait, you wait, know, wait. So yes. they had a but they had a conference on on Thursday, on Thursday. and on Friday they published the fact you had uh, to walk, look at the docket carefully. Mm -hmm. But if you if you kind of kind of are constantly trolling, <laughs> we, we have computer program. We have a computer program that watches all of the docket uh -huh. entries for cases that well, we're so watching. So if you feel yeah. constrained about reporting yeah. that, you can mention it to me. Okay, <laughs> but it happens every once in a while. But not again, not in something particularly important. But there are, you know, each of us feels different institutional constraints, mm -hmm. and that's one that, that we certainly feel. So turning then to the second case that we were going to talk, can we talk about Nina? Oh, I'm sorry. There was the second issue that's, that is common to the race cases and the same-sex cases that you mentioned. That's what happens if all of this comes in one avalanche? You know, the, if they just, you know, they're not ready until the end. And so you get there on June 27th, they're like, OK, so we're going to do two uh, same-sex marriage cases, uh, affirmative action, and Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. Good luck with that. Um, <laughs> Like what? What's the triage that you all put in place to handle something? Well, like we that? bring in reinforcements. Yeah. This is where you bring in you bring in all sorts of people who have expertise in other areas, or even you'll even go down the chain. You know, even if a person <laughs> hasn't, because you you need the sheer bodies to be able to uh, be reading, be pressing buttons. Uh, now and to be writing. And lots of things, of course. I think all of us have something pre-written on all of these. We all have like maybe five versions of what could possibly happen on some of these. And it's a matter of having people in the courtroom, having people downstairs and then just being able to get it out as fast as possible. So it is reinforcements. I cannot imagine no, I that these justices, given that they have pride in their own work, will do it all on the same day because they'll want to, they'll, what do we think, probably add maybe Wednesday or something at least. But, but Tom, Tom's point is well taken that even if we get the two same-sex marriage cases on the same day, which we probably will, or if we get two, the two wonderful race cases, which will be very meaningful and will have to be read very carefully, um, that, that will be a drag for us, for our readers, and, and for the court probably too. Well, just describe what it is. How does the court, you know, for folks who aren't as intimately familiar with it, how does the court figure out what's going to come down on any given day? <laughs> I'm not sure we know. I mean, they, they're, the chief is sort of committed, and I, the last chief did this, I think, first. They've sort of committed more or less to not doing more than five opinions on a given day. I remember when there were as many as 10 on a day. And in fact, those um, summaries that are at the top are the result of uh, Carl Stern having 10 opinions he had to report on <laughs> and hoofing it over to the Capitol, because that's what he did in those days, to file and reporting the outcome of some case and having missed some rather important footnote the he, syllabus is not a guarantee. Yeah. Not no, but it right. it's, we it, learn. no, but it's better than just looking at the first few pages and the last few pages. <laughs> and so he actually implored the, the chief justice to publish because they had those for the they were there they just weren't published to publish those at the same time so that reporters would at least have some notion. And then Rehnquist finally agreed to try to limit the number of cases per sitting. Um, what I have no idea it, about is whether they ever sit there and say, look, we could put out these four cases tomorrow, but we shouldn't do this. Let's add a day. I have no idea if they ever do that. They do have some printing capacity issues. But, yeah. but in theory, the public line is that they're ready when they're ready. So it's at least theoretically possible they all come at once, which would be very bad. <laughs> and we have 19 cases left to go. That's a lot of cases. Yeah. Of which I'd say between 8 and 10 are really newsworthy. So let's turn the corner and talk about uh, affirmative action. So Joan, in 2003, in a decision that seems to have been near and dear to the heart of Justice O'Connor, who you uh, studied so carefully for the biography and then, of course, reported on the decisions at the time, in the Michigan Law School case had come out one way and said, we'll see you in 25 years. Um, and time flies. And here we are. Um, and so I wonder about your thoughts about the historic importance of Fisher and the, what you know, the level of public interest is in the case and, and what you're thinking about and your team is thinking about and reporting on it. It's, it's very important. Of course, it will matter what they exactly do to the 2003 Grutter decision. Uh, that's the ruling where Justice O'Connor 
uh, said that you know the path to uh, education to uh, full employment in America should be open visibly to people of all all races. It's important for leadership to be diverse, and you know it was just a really strong endorsement of what Justice Powell had written in Baki 35 years ago, and uh, she reinforced it with vigor. And uh, Anthony Kennedy, who has, is now the swing vote, dissented from that. And Justice Alito, who is very much uh, even more to the right than Justice Kennedy on racial issues, succeeded Justice O'Connor. So there's a lot of potential here for uh, retrenchment in, affirm in affirmative action. This case has become a real mystery to all of us. Uh, I think in some ways we thought maybe the outcome could have been predicted uh, earlier on, but now I'm not sure. It was argued on October 10th by only eight of the justices. Elena Kagan, our former US Solicitor General, is out of the case because she had participated in a phase of it early on. Um, just as we, you know, what's at issue to remind everyone, even though most folks probably know, is the University of Texas program that supplements the top 10 uh, program that allows students who've ranked in the top 10% of their high schools to get in automatically to the flagship university at Austin. There's a, 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 a supplemental program that takes race into consideration to boost those numbers so that the campus is sufficiently diverse for educational purposes. So what, what looked like could happen here was that uh, if the court was inclined in a more conservative fashion, which it obviously is, is to maybe go after just the Texas program and not to really roll back Grutter. So we'd be watching for exactly what's the rationale for them to um, strike down the Texas program if indeed they do. If indeed they, Justice Kennedy says that uh, Texas didn't need to do this program, Texas didn't sufficiently look at other alternatives before it turned to this r racial criteria, uh, maybe it wouldn't do so much damage to uh, the 2003 ruling. So that's, you know, there, there seemed to be a way, a way that they could maybe s split things a bit and not do anything too significant to the 2003 signature ruling of Justice O'Connor. And in fact, during oral arguments, Bert Ryan, who was representing the young white student who had been rejected at the University of Texas, said, no, we're not asking you to reverse Grutter. But um, obviously something is going on because they've taken this is a it would be a hard case because it's a racial case, but to go this long, I think that you know some of us are wondering, was there some slippage in the votes one way or another? Are they, um, you know, maybe there's not going to be any opinion for the court even on the Texas program? I I actually I can see that they would definitely roll back affirmative action in some way. I do not think Anthony Kennedy sitting in the seat of Justice Powell, whom he succeeded in. Um, February of 1988, that he would be the one who would say that Bakke is no good, Grutter's no good in terms of the diversity uh, value there. So I, you know, again, it might just be me sort of seeing things through a certain lens, but I just don't think the court is ready to, to pull the trigger on that. But um, I'm wondering now just because of how long it's taken. And uh, in the same vein, I'd, I'd sort of be surprised if they upheld Texas, but who knows? Maybe they won't have the maybe they won't have a majority to get rid of it completely. Although it sort of looks like they might. So can I put out something that I think might be controversial, and I just wonder about your reactions? I seem to remember at the time of Grutter and Grants that there was a great level of interest in the civil rights community in the cases, and also just a level of protest that you know we are not going to stand for programs like these being invalidated. And I thought there was a big presence at the court. And I just wonder if anybody else has the feeling that I do that when it came to the oral arguments in Fisher and also in the Voting Rights Act case that we'll talk about in a minute, I thought that there was a, a level of giving up in the, and, and a, a felt sense that there was an inevitability to these decisions in that community that um, it was very striking, but I may be alone in that. I don't know, do, what, in the people that you were hearing from, in reactions of, the re, reactions of readers, do you think that there's a, a still a big fight that's being fought and not a sense of an inevitability here? I think people care deeply, but we're acting strategically because there's a soft landing, as Joan was suggesting, in this case. So in a funny way, in order, not, in order to try to make sure that's the result, you don't want to open the door to cataclysm you want to say, okay, maybe we can live with a ruling that says if you're already getting substantial diversity through race neutral means, you can't layer on top of that race conscious. And maybe there's a place for class based uh, affirmative action. But let's not talk and let's not embolden them to think that this case is about the end of, of Grutter. Uh, because as Bert Ryan said, that's not what they were looking for, although Justice Sotomayor responded to him 
but you are trying to gut Grutter. You know, uh, I think there's something to what you say, but I'm not sure that it's just giving up, although there is some element of that. Grutter took place during the Bush administration, and there was even a fight within the Bush administration about what position the administration would take because President Bush was actually a great proponent of affirmative action, oddly enough. And, uh, but the pop, so the politics were very mixed up in, in that case internally within the administration, but it was, the sides in some ways were, were, were more clearly drawn because you had an administration that was um, less friendly anyway to any sort of racial, racial classifications, even though the president himself didn't have that kind of a history. But Tom DeLay was a, in Congress, uh, was essentially the, was running the house in those days. It's a, it was just a very different political mix. This time we have a Democratic president, first African American president, as those who are challenging affirmative action and all race conscious things sort of shove that in the face of the, of the court all the time. And so I think it's, I just think it's harder for the civil rights community to make the, the points that it would like to make and to gin up the kind of outrage that it might have been able to gin up when there was a Republican administration. Tom, oh, go ahead. Uh, one of the things, uh, as an aside, that I found very interesting while we're waiting for this case is the differing opinions and statements outside of the court of the two justices who have directly benefited from affirmative action in, during their careers, Justices Thomas and Sotomayor, uh, have been very vocal on both sides, on, on opposite sides of this, where uh, you know, Sotomayor is embracing it as something that helped her in her beloved world to go from, you know, the Bronx housing development to the Supreme Court and how Justice Thomas has really uh, created a narrative that it has been something he's had to fight against. He's had to fight against this preconceived notion that he wasn't good enough and he wasn't qualified and that it is this burden on people of color to receive this. So yeah, you have all these things going on yeah, at a time that we do have a black president and the narrative is just so inherently different right now than it was at the time of Grutter. Tom, to your original point about giving up, during oral arguments, uh, there were two different narratives actually. During the University of Texas one, where again, Elena Kagan was out, it was more muted. And I felt like Kennedy, you know, you didn't feel a real jockeying for Kennedy's vote as much as you did when they did Shelby County. During Shelby County, Elena Kagan and Sonia Sotomayor were really out there trying to argue, trying to remind everybody that this comes from Alabama, remember Selma, remember all these things. So I felt like that one didn't have an element of it's over. It was more we're still fighting. Now, there's just two of them, and Justice Kennedy, you know, we know where he's been. We know where this court was, was at in 2009 when it ruled in the Northwest Austin case. But I feel like the, both the community and the liberals on the court feel like Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act still has much more at stake than where we might be on affirmative action. So let's turn to that, Adam. You know, the, the theory <coughs> of the case is that Section 5 is an anachronism, and therefore this case isn't a big deal. Uh, but I wonder about your take on its historic significance and the coverage of it. I think this is a situation where the presence of the really huge marquee cases, and I think the marriage cases have captured the public imagination in a way even that healthcare didn't, because nobody really cares about the Commerce Clause, but people <laughs> care, about, care about fairness and equality. So that's the huge case of the term. Um, affirmative action, people get that too. Their kids are going to college. Do they get a boost or not? They get that. In 2009, the voting rights case was the marquee case of the term. Everyone was focused on it, and I think part of the reason that the court didn't go, although they got very close, didn't go to striking down Section 5, or at least the coverage formula, was because that would have been the end of term banner headline. This year, it's going to get lost in the shuffle to a large extent, and I think that emboldens mm -hmm. the five justices on the right who are already inclined to go in that direction, and they have a brilliant sort of middle ground that can make them in their own minds look statesmanlike, 
which is to say Section 5 is great. People bled and died for it. It played a very important role. We've repeatedly upheld it. Love, love, love Section 5. But the coverage formula is no good. Coverage formula needs to be based not on 1970s data, but contemporary data. If Congress, you go back to the drawing board, we love Section 5, but you're going to have to do it on contemporary data. And that will have the practical consequence, of course, in this Congress Got of it. blowing up Section 5 in a way where the justices on the right are going to feel that their fingerprints are not all over this. Now, they're not going to get away with that if that's what they do. We will not write it that way. <laughs> well, no, I mean, it's not a question of, it's not, you have to write the reality, not the pretend reality. So the lead still has to be that the court struck down the coverage formula, effectively gutting Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. So you're not writing a, you have to write about what, what is, not what somebody, the way somebody would like to spin it. All right, before we turn to questions, let's do technology. Yes. And let's talk about DNA and the challenges that are presented both with, uh, for the court in dealing with new technologies and in covering them. So you uh, have already done work on both the Myriad case and also the King case. Right, right. You know, I was all prepared to talk about how the court seems very skittish about technology and will rule around <laughs> any way they can. I mean, I remember a couple years ago watching the justices trying to figure out how cell phones and text messages and pagers worked, and it seemed so, you know, <laughs> confounding to them. And um, in, in these two cases where, that I was lucky enough to have come down, it seemed that that wasn't uh, the issue at all. In, in, in the Myriad Genetics case, uh, Justice Thomas seemed to very, you know, crystallize down what this was about. One part, you know, one, a portion of DNA, even if it's isolated, is not, is natural. If you synthesize it, it's not. So you can patent the latter, but not the former, done. And, you know, in Scalia's little paragraph long concurrence is like, I ditto that except for the science part. Well, can I just ask a question about that? <laughs> yes. Right. What do you make of, of the word when he says, I can totally get, I suppose, him saying, you know, I don't know DNA, so I can't say from personal experience. Uh, but there's the line where he says, or belief. That, you know, I don't know that I believe in this stuff. And it, what... <laughs> Well, I, mean, I, I heard a member of the court say that that member of the court was inclined to put in his own concurrence saying, I, I think I get it. I think I understood it. <laughs> right. And believe in right. it. I, I, I was thinking of concurring in my own newspaper article because I didn't quite get the difference either. I see. Well, the, yeah. but the other thing, I mean, I, when I was preparing for this case, I read so many briefs and I got an acute case of Migo and my eyes glaze over. Uh, and, and I... I kept trying to ascertain what the difference was, in fact, between DNA and cDNA. And it's really not quite clear the way Justice Thomas describes it, nor does he claim in the opinion that it's necessarily uh, patentable. He says it'll have to be essentially a case-by-case -case basis. Right, right. So uh, to talk in the, so I, the one brief that was crystal clear to me was the government's brief. It was simple, was really well written, and it tried to make the case to draw the line just the way the court drew it. And it wasn't just dumb me. My husband is a, is a doctor and a scientist, and he was the only one that he got entirely. So I finally said to one of the members of the court who I saw this in, late in this past week, I said, um, I did have the impression that the court was going to go with the government's position because at least you could understand it. And he said, right. <laughs> exactly. You know, it was a, I have to say, you know, on the subject of the Solicitor General and the government here, that was a position that they bought because the SG doesn't have a pretty good record before this court, but that one played right into their need. It's funny, Tommy, though, you, you mentioned the believe word because most people responded, including the justice that Adam referred to, to his just sort of saying, we don't really get it, don't hold us to it. More the scientific uh, molecular biology part than anything that would be more ideological. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, it just, when I, you know, talked to my sources and experts after this case came out, it just sort of ended in a bit of a flop. I mean, it's pretty narrow. 
it kind of gives each side a little bit of what they wanted. Everybody claimed victory. And you know, I was talking to one of my sources. It's like, look, the genome's already been mapped for years. You know, there's only so much we can get out of it. The big fight will be on the next big emerging piece of technology. We still have the method patents and all that. So it, it wasn't as big of a case as I was hoping it was going to be, at least according to the people. Well, if it had gone the other way, it well, sure right. would have been. Right, right. All so. right. We have what are actually a, a terrific set of questions, so maybe we will turn to those. And I encourage you all to, to jump in, and we'll have a bit of a lightning round. <laughs> what has been the most challenging case for you to cover, and why? It's all that easy. <laughs> ACA, does that qualify? Were there, what, you know, what was? Did you argue that Arlington County case? Uh, that FCC, yeah. City of Arlington, yes. Yeah, City of Arlington. Yes. Yeah, that was, uh, that, that was that very was hard. Not. Decker was hard. Minor cases yeah. that are very complicated procedurally, that barely rise to the level of a story, and you commit yourself to writing it, and you're going, what was I thinking? <laughs> <laughs> Where you haven't spent, you know, weeks getting ready for it, but the decision comes down, and you're like, ah. No, I even the argument, the argument, actually, argument stories are much harder. Decisions, in truth, by the time you get the decision, if you're doing the job right, you will have read the briefs, you will have gone to the argument, you're, and and the decisions tend to be written, particularly if there's a dissent, fairly understandably. It's the argument story that's hard to write. I agree, especially if it has, deals with ERISA or the bankruptcy code or a lot of things that I write about. That is very tough. Regarding the ACA, how did CNN, and I'll add ther parenthetically Fox News, uh, get it so wrong? That oh, was easy. You're, you're the, you're Tom, the Tom, you should answer you that You should one. answer that. Well, Tom, I mean, is the, Tom is the I, author of a 5,000 word, 500,000 word <laughs> exegesis of all of this. I just want to say that when Tom was writing this, because he worked for me when he was a kid, he, actually, he showed it to me, and I thought it was a great piece. I did. I made a couple of suggestions, and then it didn't come out, and it didn't come out. And finally, I said to him, Tom, you're in journalism now. This is not a brief. Publish the sucker. <laughs> well, I mean, there's the, there's the micro version of how it happened, and there's the meta version of how it happened. The micro version involves you know, people on different phone lines and putting down phones and things like that. It can take a long time to explain. But I'm, I'm interested in the meta, and that is your experienced journalists. What is it culturally that led to that happening? Because it's, it's done, it's in the past, but how does Being it... Being first, the idea that on something like that you have to be first. And I've never felt that way. I mean, and it saved my butt more than once. But it is the notion that your bosses believe you absolutely, that you, you could be fired if you're not first. They forgot the second part. If you're first and wrong, it's way worse. <laughs> You know, I, the basic problem was they thought there was a syllogism. If, if, if not sustained under Commerce Clause, mandate goes down. And they didn't mysteriously think that there might be some other way to sustain the mandate. My question has always been, do, does anyone think that the Chief Justice wrote and announced the opinion the way he did purposely <laughs> to sort of give the opinion saying, you know, no, 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 what the Commerce Clause is all wrong, it's all wrong, but... 20 minutes later. He did the same thing in Northwest in Austin. Yeah. He likes to mess with you. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why it's good to be in the courtroom. Right. So you all had, you all had to sit through the whole thing, and then you we got did, the, you, he buried the lead, but he eventually got there. You get there. <laughs> uh, cameras in the courtroom. Pros and cons uh, for cameras in the courtroom. And you know, what do you think the root of the resistance is? And, and I'd like to hear your prediction for the year in the, that mm -hmm. the court finally broadcasts oral arguments? Well, you know, they've given many reasons themselves. They, they don't trust each other in front of the cameras, as many of you have probably heard. You know, they, they're afraid somebody's going to be showing off. They're afraid that the lawyers are going to argue in a different way. They feel like they're entrusted to this, the integrity of the institution. And if TV is allowed to come in, it will, sometime, it will somehow compromise the integrity of it. They point, to, they point to Congress and say, look what happened over there. I personally think. <laughs> I personally think it would be a wonderful thing for all the people in America to be able to see what happens in the courtroom. You know, the courtroom is already very small. Not many people get to come there. It would be a terrific civics lesson. But I actually like covering oral arguments because I like being the one who can show the drama in some ways to people who aren't there. So I, I sort of like having a little claim on that, as we all have a claim on that, um, to bring people into the courtroom that they can't get to. 
but I think it would be a terrific civic value to open it up the way the other branches have uh, for, to TV. And a prediction, Tom, about when that would happen. Uh, if we're all like Lyle, we'll still be covering the court <laughs> at age 82 uh, as he is. But um, I wonder if it will even happen in my lifetime, to tell you the truth. Really? Yeah. So no one, no one will give the un take the under on 10 years? I, we've seen uh, Justices Kagan and Sotomayor, after saying how great cameras were during their confirmation mm -hmm. hearings, both change their minds. Uh, I don't think there's any enthusiasm on the court for it. I think there's absolutely no principled reason uh, to bar the public from seeing their government at work. But if I were on the court, I wouldn't see the upside for me. I mean, it would, it's you know, he hello, is, John, is it hello, good, John Is it good for me? Yeah, the it's, is it good for me, Basically, rule? you want to look at it through the prism of, you know, is it good for LipTech? Right? Yeah, and is it going to be, you know, is it, are you going to take some little snippet, it's going to be on John Stewart, make you look stupid, make the court look stupid? Um, I, I think they are actually concerned about that. I do think that, um, and I think the chief, and my guess is that this was his idea, really did a shrewd thing, putting the audio at, up every week at the end of the week. It takes some of the argument away. If you say you can't he even hear this argument for a year, that really is, is not a reasonable proximity. But to say that an argument that's on Wednesday you can hear Friday afternoon, that that's the only Obstacle, but it's a very self-conscious way to make sure it doesn't get into actual news coverage. Absolutely, so it's just late enough that you can't use it. Exactly right. Although I've used it, and not obviously in the first day stories, but when you're always looking for audio. <laughs> <laughs> Will anybody take the under on twenty years? Under no? twenty. I'll take the under on twenty years. I think that the, there's a generational change to come. I actually. I'm going to make a oh, note. Okay. Um, I think we'll that all be dead. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll be able to crutch or a cane. I think actually that the, when you see something like Justice Kagan and Justice Sotomayor having endorsed it before their hearings and now walking that back, I think that's a conformity within the court not to create a public impression of dissent on an issue that they're seriously discussing. I think. You know, I dissent. Okay. I, I predict that, that when, uh, when Tom I'm Goldstein is named one of the top hundred lawyers over eighty. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, what influence, if any, do you think the press has on the court from the other direction? We had one example that you talked about, the possibility in the year of Namudno when the case would have been, it would have been such a banner. That's not the press as such, but it's nonetheless the public's reaction to the decisions. But do you, what, you know, either in this generation of the press corps, in the past, but, you know, is there some interaction in that way? Wasn't there some phrase people used to throw around? There was a greenhouse effect of some kind. Mm. Yes. I, they, I think they follow the coverage, and at the margins, it's got to affect them somewhat. And in what, but... Hard what, to say. Hard to say. Yeah, I think so. Right. Uh, and, you know, some of them care more than others. Mm. I do think there are times... The only time that comes to mind... Um, there were some press cases in the 70s in which, I, I can't remember the name of the case, where the court finally said, no, you can't just keep reporters out of a, out of a trial. Um, Richmond newspapers. Yeah, Richmond newspapers. Uh, and I, in that, there had been a lot of press coverage because prior to that, there, had, there were other cases that seemed to suggest that that might be a possibility. They were all centered around protest and stuff like that. But, and, and I did think that that had an effect on the court. Well, it had this effect. Berger would self-assign the pro-press cases and form out the anti-press cases. Well, it did. But I think also people actually said, well, we, we don't really want to be in the position of, of not having public trials. Of so uh, there had been questions raised from previous cases that I think led to a very strong opinion in Richmond newspapers that might not have happened otherwise. Yeah, my, for the little that it's worth, my impression is that I don't see the justices changing their views uh, with, in response to press coverage. I do think that the shifting tides of the country, for example, on same-sex marriage, have to still affect, oh, yeah. the, say, the center of the court 
even if not in the judgments that they issue, how they express things. It would be very shocking to, for example, see a decision written today the way Bowers versus Hardwick was written in 1986. Uh, we're, I, we aren't even technically part of the press corps because the court still doesn't recognize the blog, but if, if a justice, we get calls from justices who disagree with something that we write or, or find some statistics that they don't agree with. Uh, so they definitely follow their press a lot. Um, <laughs> On uh, the next question, you know, there's a lot of discussion about oral argument and how active it is. And so this question reflects a, a sense that perhaps that that reflects some broader disagreement within the court, that it's oral argument can be so rancorous, there can be so many questions. Is the court, the question asks, as an institution becoming less civil or perhaps more civil? What's going on both with respect to oral argument and the relationship between the members of the court? I don't, think it's, I don't think it shows that they disagree more. It shows that they talk more. Yes. The newer justices ask more questions than the ones they just replaced. Uh, I think many of them are self-conscious about the fact that it looks like a catastrophically overbooked cable TV show sometimes. The, the advocates don't have a chance to respond to questions. Um, but I don't, I don't think it's an instance of sort of polarization. It's just personality types. Yeah, behind the scenes, everything that we hear is that uh, they, they get along, and, and there's such an incentive to get along because they're appointed for life. So they, uh, they, clo they close ranks. They close ranks against us. They close ranks against outsiders, and they, uh, they seem to have a pretty good uh, nine-member group going. On the bench, though, I think they, there are a lot of people who either were uh, academics who like to talk a lot, or they're just used to talking a lot. And uh, they're the, New Yorkers. Four oh yeah, we got. Yorkers. Yeah, no, that's it. That's it. And they and they uh, they're not as self-conscious as most people are in terms of saying, "Oh no, you go first. They they're not that kind of people. They they've got a limited amount of time. They feel like their questions are super important. And you know, in some respect, thank goodness, maybe Clarence Thomas isn't speaking. We'd never, you know, the person at the lectern would not get a word in edgewise. And on that score, I, it's amazing how many of the justices will, will say, you know, I think maybe Justice Thomas has a point that, he should, that uh, we ha don't hear but enough from them. Stop them. Right, well, and it's also the most talkative who aren't saying, oh yeah, Justice Thomas has a point. And one of the reasons, that, from what I understand, that Obama was drawn toward Kagan as a nominee was to be sort of the oral argument foil to Justice Scalia, to someone who could sort of stand up and, and you know, if he tries to bully his way into a, a comment, you know, bully right back. And that puts the chief in the position, which I've noticed a lot this term, of being the referee, of saying, no, you stop, you go, and, you know, sort of direct the traffic when it comes from the justices. There's one other thing, and I've said this before, it's very hard to hear sometimes in the courtroom, so that it's hard for people at one end of the bench to actually hear that someone is trying to intervene at the other end of the bench. There was one day when Alito tried, I think 10 times, to get a question. And finally, he just shrugged his shoulders, and he and Kagan just grinned. But clearly, the, the opposite end of the bench, and it wasn't just Sotomayor, they just didn't hear him. Well, as an oral advocate, I think the justices are perfect. Um, <laughs> Adam, there was, going back to oral argument for a second, there was, and the question of, of uh, public, uh, the public getting to see it, you wrote about line standers. And I just want, there's a question, can Adam talk more about the line stander article and has there been any fallout from it? I don't know of any, so, so the basic question issue problem is that on the big, big arguments, and same-sex marriage is a good example of this, people line up days ahead of time in two lines, one for the Supreme Court bar, one for the general public. Uh, and they don't necessarily line up to hold a space for themselves. Sometimes they're people who are being paid, I don't know, 30 bucks an hour to stand for days on behalf of lawyers, celebrities, and others. And, you know, your moral philosopher might think that's not perfect. And the court <laughs> might take some interest in it because these lines aren't particularly well regulated. A rock concert line is better regulated than what takes place in front of the Supreme Court. And the court sort of washes its hands of this phenomenon. And it, 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 it's sort of an instance of you're not going to have cameras, but at least maybe allocate what little public access is on some sort of fair basis. And I'm persuaded that these places online should not be put out to bid, but maybe you have a different view, Tom. Well, as Adam knows, when Adam has a press pass, and so he gets a seat in the courtroom, and we don't. Because I'm a proxy for the public. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so we actually use line standers, and it's a terrible dilemma. You know, as someone who's testified in favor of cameras in the courtroom, I think it's a horrible, horrible situation and a complete cluster. I mean, don't, I think, 
that SCOTUS blog doesn't have a press pass is an outrage. Is a, I don't get that separate, at all. No, I don't either. Especially now that you've got one on the Hill and they always told you that, you, that they would follow the same rules as the Hill. So you, now you have one on the Hill and they say, oh no, that's not the case anymore. Um, they're perfect. The, um, <laughs> how concerned are the justices about the trust that the public places in the court after cases like Bush versus Gore, Citizens United, um, uh, the uh, health care case, and the like? Well, those are all 5-4 cases where they might say, well, not everybody was unhappy. Right. You know, so it's, it, and it, we saw that after Bush v. Gore, you know, some of us thought, oh my gosh, what will happen to the standing of the institution? There certainly was uh, a change in the polls, but it's, it's steadied, it's steadied. And it's amazing how we find pollsters discovering that people think the court isn't conservative enough. You know, I don't, you wonder what people are actually thinking about there, actually, <laughs> on some of these. No, we, you know, when you think, going into healthcare, a lot of us did a lot of polling, and we're doing polling now. And I think, you know, Roe v. Wade is still in people's minds somehow, or just the kind of uh, angst that you hear certain, you know, talking heads, you know, uh, refer to about, you know, this court has moved so far to the left. Well, look who's, look who's on the court. So it's, I think that the, whatever the Supreme Court is using for its level of trust when it looks at the popular reaction is not probably giving it a true picture, and it's probably heartened in some ways about the fickleness of polls. But I do think institutionally, getting back to cameras and other things, they do feel like they want a public trust. They, of course, have no money. They only have their decisions. And uh, they, they want to be respected okay. probably more than the other institutions feel it. That's part of the it. reason that they are concerned about cameras, that it would be twisted and make them look mm -hmm. not serious. Mm -hmm. Yes, for anybody who wants to sit through an hour-long argument, they will look serious. But for anybody who wants to make fun of them or make them look biased, you can do that too. So I think that's part of their concern. But in fact, the polling hasn't stayed static. Like every other institution in government, uh, except apparently the military, uh, the public confidence has gone down significantly since, uh, since 2000. And Bush versus Gore actually, you saw the, the confidence of the court go down significantly. That was principally because of Democrats and independents who had lost some confidence. And after the ACA, you saw, saw the number of Republicans who had confidence go down. And now they're in the 30s somewhere. And they used to be well over, you know, quite recently, well over 50%. So they have lost public confidence, but they probably don't think it's because of anything they've done at this point, and they might be right. What kinds of academic and professional qualifications do you need to be a legal reporter, and what's the process for becoming an intern in the field? I believe this is an application. <laughs> um, <laughs> But we have incredibly diverse qualifications from you know, people who are lawyers, people who practice, people who uh, were journalists from the very beginning. What, you know, there are a lot of different ways to get from here to there, I think. Yeah, my paper really struggled with that, being that it was you know, both a, a journalistic operation and a legal operation. At first, they required the only requirement was that you had to have a JD. And then they found they got a lot of people who couldn't write very well. And then they switched it to focusing more on people with journalistic uh, backgrounds. And then they found that they, you know, the legal issues would confound people. And so then they kind of swayed toward the middle. So I, I did have to have the law degree now um, when they hire, and also journalism degree. So it's, it's tough. I mean, you, the two, legal writing and journalistic preparation, the writing, they don't go together at all. They're completely <laughs> different. And so it's a tough field, but. Well, it, uh, some of it, I came up through covering uh, politics and, and government, and then switched to, started covering the court in the late 80s. And I think even though we all have different backgrounds, a couple of, I have a law degree um, that I got along the way, uh, but it's, it's amazing how many of us really like the same kind of thing. We love the stories each year, and we're also on an academic calendar. So we tend to get, we tend to be a crowd that works with hell, yellow highlighters. We like to kind of, we're, we sort of like the way the cycle goes. And uh, as I said, many, I mean, Nina, how long have you been covering it? Eight years. Since 1968. Since 1968, I, <laughs> now I cover pretty much most of the time only the court. I do have an NSA story for Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or whenever, but, but 
In the old days, I covered the court, the Justice Department, all the intelligence community, and the House and Senate Judiciary Committees. I don't know how I did that. And there are now, I don't know, maybe eight people who cover those things at NPR. But now, I'm, so I, but I, that's when I started, was in 1968. And I'm not a lawyer. Mm -hmm. I think these days maybe half the press corps has law degrees. I think I'm the only one with substantial practice experience. I don't know that the law degree by itself is a significant plus. You do have to learn how to digest legal materials. But if you do this job, that's what you do. So if you don't do it well the first year, you'll do it fine by the fifth year. I do think that um, you know, having done some of the mechanics of civil litigation does give you a, a feel for the texture of the cases that even the justices sometimes seem not to have. Uh, <laughs> That's number three. Um, You've whacked them three times today. I, I don't even remember the other two. I mean, those are good whacks, Al. Um, <laughs> for, the, for the second half of the question, Nina's, Nina famously has unbelievably talented interns, but do any of... <laughs> do, do, does anybody else do... Uh, is there another way to kind of break in for a young law student? Do you all work with anybody, or it's a solo act? We, we have interns, but they, ha they go through this huge process. I think most, uh, all three news organizations that I work for, you came up actually through kind of a really tough screening process where they wanted folks who had worked at um, smaller papers and then uh, went on the way up. And a law degree was not very valuable, frankly, in that process. But do you all work personally with interns, or they're just assigned to bureaus or the organization? Do they come to the court with you? How does it work? I don't, and I, but I do have one, maybe half a tip. You see occasionally uh, even law students start a blog, and I'm thinking in particular of Mike Sachs, mm -hmm. who started a, this, this neat blog called uh, First One at First Street. He would be the first one online or tried to that be. That was after he was my, my intern. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's really only one road. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I used to take, and I still would, I suppose, if I got a spectacular undergraduate applicant. Ari Shapiro, our White House correspondent, was my intern. That's how he came to NPR. And he was a, he doesn't have a law degree. He just graduated from Yale. And I've had wonderful interns. I've had a few lemons. There's no way. Uh, the winter interns get credit. So they all c apply to me. I don't let NPR have anything to do with it at <laughs> all. It's my choice for good or ill. And um, it's very difficult because there's so, so many young people who are so fabulously qualified and so smart, and in fact, in truth, much smarter than I am. I'm just more experienced than they are, but they are much smarter than I am, and on a couple of occasions. I've, been, I've had such a dilemma that I asked Tom to do a short interview for me and see what he thought. I've asked for help, and it's arbitrary. What can I tell you? you once you get past, it's a little bit like affirmative action. Once you get past the threshold of being in the top 10 of the applicants that I've gotten, or 15, there's some arbitrariness to it. And whether I think you know, the person sits as, as close as, as um, Kim is sitting to me, Can I, do I want to have this person as a companion for four months? Yeah. You know. Similar question, I think, to what judges go through in picking out law clerks, right? It's a very close environment. Do they really want to hang out with this person? Will they add a lot of value? Uh, let me, I think what we're going to do, since we started 10 minutes early, we're going to try and finish 10 minutes early. But I wonder about closing thoughts about this court. Um, and, you know, is, it, it strikes me that this term in particular is genuinely special. I mean, you gave the example, Adam, of how the Section 5 case would have been the Banner case. You know, we haven't talked at all about the Arizona voting case, for example. Mm -hmm. There are other cases that would have gotten unbelievable attention in any other year. And I just wonder about your thoughts about, as someone who has the opportunity to cover the court and present information about it to the public, what it is for people who don't have the context of having seen the court for many years should be thinking about this moment in time. And, to me, how weird it is that you know, the Constitution's been around for a while, and so many new and important questions are being decided by the court for the first or second time the opposite way. Um, but you know, what a remarkable time it is. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree, Tom. And I think the, the thing we'll all be watching for is what kind of markers they put down. Um, I think the, the case that would have the greatest potential for the greatest real you know, 
blockbuster will be if they do serious damage to Section 5. I think in the others, there are, there are half steps that they'll take, but they're important, important steps because they'll set down markers for the future. For example, in, in the gay rights dilemma, they're not going to say that um, same-sex marriage should be legal nationwide as a matter of constitutional law or that Prop 8 should stand as a matter of constitutional law, but whatever they say on that will be important for going forward. Uh, ditto for affirmative action. I will be surprised if somehow they completely gut what happened in 2003, uh, and especially when they've got this other case sitting there from uh, Michigan in terms of whether there can be a referendum that actually forbids uh, any kind of racial criteria for contracting or um, higher education in the state of Michigan. But uh, so I think all of these have great potential, but they can punt in various ways. So what's important for us is to see institutionally what is the court trying to say at this moment and what is Chief Justice Roberts trying to pull together. Maybe last year we saw the first step of him doing something that we might not have predicted when he, a classic Reagan administration um, a lawyer, someone who had had certain markers along the way, came onto this court. And I still think of him as very conservative, but he certainly ruled in various ways that, that would make me pull back a little bit. And maybe we'll see further signals this time around that he is trying to pull back and not be as hardline over on the right. So, so that will be a test. But I think any way they go on these three big issues uh, will be important for um, several decades. Thoughts on where this term stands? And I think a point that we don't make well enough is that the court is very assertive in the following sense. It reaches, it, it claims to you know, just be open for business and when the cases reach it, the cases reach it. But in fact, it's been very assertive in the uh, cases it's chosen to address. It certainly didn't need to take the Fisher case. There are significant standing and other vehicle problems in it. It certainly could have at least held Prop 8 while it decided DOMA. Uh, and there's a sense in which this is a court that's willing to reach out and insert itself, and the reason we have such a rich docket is because it's willing to be assertive in finding cases to decide. Well, and it set down those markers before in the voting area. And for example, if it does uh, strike down the, the law in the Arizona case, the, the proof of citizenship, it'll invite more of those kinds of cases to sort of completely undermine all the effort that went into making it easier to register to vote. Uh, so you can see how these, it, these cases can feed into other cases in the future, or the opposite can be true. Um, we'll see how assertive the court is. If it's very assertive, it's going to produce more of these kinds of cases. Yeah. One interesting example is what areas has the Roberts Court not gotten into in terms of really reversing the legacy of the O'Connor era, and what could we see that they haven't done yet? They have a semi-significant religion case, that's, that's right? That's an example. And they have an abortion cert petition out of Oklahoma, a kind of cousin of a post Roe v. Wade case, mm -hmm. and so it, that yes. really, the assertiveness on those kinds of questions will well, be really Well, it would be really interesting. interesting since we have a court, the conservatives on this court are, we would have thought, pretty much executivists, but we'll start to see in the uh, lab, in the NLRB case and in probably cases to follow, whether in, a, in an era when the president is no longer a Republican and we had a generation of mainly Republican presidents, we'll start to see whether that switches too, whether suddenly executive power is somewhat diminished um, uh, instead of enhanced. I would say one thing in, in fairness to the Roberts Court in this crowd. This term, there have been more authentic and fairly significant nine-zip decisions, not with fractured concurrences and so on, but really all nine of them, finding a way to address a significant issue narrowly. Um, and that's, that's probably a sign of the fact that we now have three years of the same bunch of people working together, knowing how each other's uh, habits of mind work, and finding places they can come together. And I think that also speaks to the question as to is the court aware of its perception? I think that it's very aware of its perception. Mm -hmm. It's very aware. I think the Chief Justice is very uh, aware about how he wants the court to be seen or not wants the court to be seen in terms of history. I think the health care ruling was a great 
example of that, that it's about more than finding the, the right vote. It's about you know ruling in a way that does not seem to be you know predictably conservative or, or <laughs> things like that, that it's a, a broader issue at work. All right, tremendous. Well, help, join me in thanking our panel. <laughs> <laughs>